Oh, good morning. It's, uh, it's my privilege to continue the series that we've kicked off in Ephesians. Um, so I'm taking Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure it should come up on the screen. I just want to reiterate the context of, uh, of the book. So I'm doing two things at once here, so, which is never a good idea for me. <clears throat> as my wife will testify. So we're going to be reading Ephesians 2. I thought I'd just read from the NLT. I didn't know if we were going to have visitors. I just thought that was a bit more of an accessible translation. But as I go through the talk, I'll be probably uh, being, being uh, the NIV. So, um, so we've got uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Um, I just want to remind you of the context that Chris uh, took us through in, in the, uh, the first session on this passage. This is a book written by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church. Um, as Chris said, unlike some of his other letters, this wasn't really rebuking or correcting behaviour. It was more about displaying or explaining some of the truths of the good news of Jesus Christ. We call those doctrines and just taking them deeper. And that's been really my prayer over this message is that um, for those that already know Jesus, this is an opportunity to go deeper in our understanding in some of those uh, simple truths of the faith. Um, and if we've got people here that maybe don't know Jesus, this is a great opportunity to, to just unpack what we have uh, or what we call the, the gospel, the good news. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's read uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 uh, in the NLT. So it's entitled Made Alive with Christ. <clears throat> once you were alienated, uh, once you were dead, sorry, <laughs> because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. <laughs> it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Jesus Christ. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Some wonderful truths there and uh, I definitely relate to Chris when he said this, there's, there's too much in two verses to cover in just a small talk on a Sunday. Um, I feel like it's a, a massive uh, buffet and we've just got five minutes to pick the best bits out of the bits that, that we want to. So that's what we, we're looking at a really rich passage here and um, I want us just to go deeper as I say this morning. Uh, I also just want to give a quick explanation before we start about the word salvation, uh, just so that I know that everyone's on the same page. <laughs> um, it, salvation as a word means to be saved or delivered from something. In the Christian context, salvation means that when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead three days later, he made it possible for every human being to be saved and delivered from the consequences of their sin. Salvation means being saved from separation from God both now and into eternity and creates a rea the reality of relationship with God himself. And I just loved Grace's testimony this morning of just how she stepped from that place of confusion into relationship with God. It's just like Chris said, it's, a, it's just amazing how this passage is being uh, unpacked on a baptism service morning. So it's, it, we're going to see, I think that, that might even be the best message you heard actually from Grace this morning um, to, 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 be, to be telling the truth. Right, so, so this passage is all about salvation. We've got 10 verses. Um, I've, I think I've titled this talk, I think it's changed a few times, but I've titled it Our Problem, God's Solution. Um, 
And for me, whenever I'm looking at stuff, I like to see context and detail. And I, I think the context of the whole, mess, whole letter has been said. But in this passage, we've got three verses, one to three, which is talked about our predicament, our state. And then we've got verses four to seven, which looks at God's work uh, in response to our state or our problem, our predicament. Verses eight and nine looks at the method of salvation and verse 10, the effects of God's action. So we'll, we'll just unpack that, in, uh, we'll unpack this passage in those sections. So verses one to three, we've already read it. Um, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. And this is my first point that I think is really important. We're dead before God gets involved in our lives. We're spiritually dead. And that's really important because it greatly affects the worship we have for God. As Constable's commentary explains it, there are three schools of thought in terms, in terms of the human moral state, I might pronounce this wrong, Pelagianism, I think it's pronounced. Now that just says that the human state, we are, as a human being, I'd say morally neutral and just need teaching to be uh, morally perfect. Uh, then there's semi pelagianism which admits that human beings are sort of ill or broken in their nature and just need treating or healing. But biblical Christianity states that our nature is far worse that we're not half dead, needing healing. We're not broken, needing fixing. We're not drowning, needing saving, but we're dead and need resurrecting. And as Warren Rearsby's brilliant New Testament commentary puts it, the unbeliever's not sick, he's dead. He does not need resuscitation, he needs resurrection. Now, you may wonder why that's important. You may already know that that's true, but it does impact us personally. It impacts, and it's important because we need to give God glory and credit for, and recognition for what he's done and to the extent he has done it. And if we're generally good but, but need teaching or we're just spiritually ill but, and need healing or fixing in some way, God's achievement in salvation is somehow lessened. I'll revisit this point in a minute as we go through a bit further. But that's, that's the first point is that we are spiritually dead. And spiritually dead, as the passage tells us, means that we're governed by the flesh, which is our feelings, desires, corrupted by sin. The unsaved soul cannot please God, cannot live by the Spirit, as Paul writes in Galatians 5, 16 to 26, and Romans 8, 1 to 17. That is, when we're spiritually dead, we can't live in relationship with God. We can't live pleasing to him. We can't live influenced by God in our thought, emotions, and actions. We've got no choice in that spiritually dead state or ability to do so. But the saved soul, the one that's been resurrected, as we will look at in a minute, can live a life in relationship to God, pleasing him, just like Grace talked talk, talk, talk about this morning. We can live submitting our thoughts, emotions, desires to God and have him govern those parts of us. And this is what sets apart the believer or the follower of Jesus from those who are not following. This is the evidence of faith that uh, is written about in the book of James. It's the, it's the works, or it might even be, you could point to the fruits of the spirit in the book of Galatians. It's this outworking of that relationship with God that you should be able to see. Jesus says, doesn't he? He says, you'll be able to see what type of tree it is by the fruit that's, that's born of it. And um, in, this, <clears throat> in this spiritually dead state, Living under the influence of our flesh, we are under God's wrath. We're under his judgment, his righteous judgment of, of evil. Now, God is love, and an integral part of love is justice. Knowing that there is uh, good and evil, um, and that someday evil will be judged by a morally perfect and holy God seems to make sense to me, morally speaking. And interestingly, the concept of right and wrong, good and evil is everywhere. It's in all, all humanity. But the atheistic worldview has got no satisfactory justification for its existence. A holy God makes it perfectly reasonable. So this is our state, completely dead, hopeless situation, uh, under God's wrath and judgment. And then we hit verse four to seven, God's work. Verse four begins with, I think, two of the most hope-filled words I've read in a long time in the, in the Bible, but God. Those hope-filled words, but God, that is a hope-filled truth. No matter how dead a situation is, we have a but God moment. The one that knows no limits, 
who is above every natural law, who governs every molecule and atom, creates galaxies, the almighty God who parted seas and rivers, who defeats armies with a few hundred soldiers, who shuts lion's mouths, creates life in dead wombs, who removes incurable diseases, breaks open the earth, eclipses the sun and stills the storm. The God who dies on a cross and rolls the tomb away three days later, alive again. That God is close and involved in your life and mine. That God takes dead souls and brings them to life. The hopeless situation of our dead spiritual life is given hope through those two words, but God. And any hopeless situation you are facing or will face is no longer hopeless because of those two words, but God whether it's cancer or an accident, financial debts, cost of living, depression, anxiety, health concerns, relational breakdown. I just want to say over all those situations, but God. That God can be involved in all of those situations. So <clears throat> it's God's work, <laughs> but God. We read in verses four to seven, um, but God who is rich in mercy and grace <clears throat> made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So it's God's work. Our salvation, he takes the initiative. It's because of his great love he makes us alive when we were dead. And th that is why that first point is so important. Our salvation is all about God's actions. If, if we do not see ourselves as dead, spiritually speaking, resurrected by God himself, then we lessen our worship and awe of God and what he has done. We thank him for healing us or we thank him for teaching us or repairing us in some way instead of thanking him for resurrecting us from the dead. Not those other things you know, wouldn't be worthy of thanks and praise, but let's give God glory and praise for the extent of what he has truly done in our lives. Now, just, I'll just illustrate this. Just imagine for a minute that you, you broke your finger or something. Say you broke your finger doing some DIY. Oh, sorry, Chris, taking photos. Um, and someone, so you, you've broken your finger and someone here in the morning prays for you and your finger snaps back into place. It's fully moving. All, all, all pain is gone. It's completely healed. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Okay, some of you think so. I thought it would be amazing. <laughs> it would be amazing. And we'd give God praise and glory for that, wouldn't we? Now imagine someone close to you has died and they're pronounced dead, taken to the morgue and two weeks later you're at their funeral and someone lays hands on that coffin and there's knocking from inside the casket, it's opened and they get themselves out. Same level of praise as the broken finger? Same level of surprise, same level of thanks, same level of awe? Of course not, of course not. The state of that latter, you know, of the person that's died was so much more hopeless and therefore, our praise and worship should be so much more because we were spiritually dead. That's why it's important to know that, 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 that before the but God moment in your salvation story, in my salvation story, we were utterly dead with no hope of recovery. And we are, those that follow Jesus, have given out lives to him, are a resurrection story. And it's a resurrection that that, that's more amazing than a physical resurrection. Spiritual resurrection is more amazing than physical resurrection. Now, why, you might ask, uh, why, why, <laughs> why is it more amazing? I mean, if we saw someone rise from the dead, we would be pretty amazed, but we need to make sure that we value spiritual resurrection far greater than reading about when Lazarus walks out of the tomb after three days when Jesus calls him out. And I want to give you two reasons why that might be. The first reason spiritual resurrection is more amazing than physical is because when, when we were spiritually dead, we were enemies of God. That, 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 it's amazing that God does this anyway, but he does it for his enemies. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And Colossians 1.21 says, Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. God resurrects his enemies, which is just incredible. Uh, uh, so spiritual resurrection is, is more amazing in that sense than physical resurrection because we were 
um, God's enemies. But as one commentary helped me see, the other thing is that when you're physically resurrected, let's take Lazarus, he went back to his same life he had before um, when he was physically resurrected. I mean, there might be a few changes, but generally he lived out the same physical life, where a spiritual resurrection is total transformation. We, we, we have a whole new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ saved, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And I keep coming back to it, that's what Grace testified, a, a new life. And those of us that know Jesus as, as their saviour have this amazing experience of having a new life, spiritually alive, able to live in fellowship with God. We are a new creation and what is even more amazing is we read in verse 6 that God raised us up in Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We, we're not only raised to life, but we're given this new position in close fellowship with Jesus in the heavenly realms. And what grace. What grace. The, the word grace literally means unmerited favour. And what a brilliant example we have of God's grace here in this passage, that that we're all born into sin, separated from God, spiritually dead. We are all enemies of God and rightfully guilty before him. He would be perfectly justified and right to judge every human being as guilty and do away with a lot of us. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, chooses not to condemn us guilty. That's mercy. I know we've gone over this a few times in this church, but I think reflecting on it this week, I don't think you can have grace without mercy, first of all. Mercy is like the foundation that grace is built on. And so here we have this brilliant example of God who would be justified in judging every human being guilty and then in Christ chooses not to. That's grace. And then he takes it a step further. It's the second step in, in the mercy grace journey. He takes it a step further and doesn't just not condemn us, but then chooses to resurrect us and lift us up in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus to put us in close fellowship with God himself for all eternity. That's grace. And it's just amazing that God chooses to resurrect us and enable us to know him and love him and be loved by him. What grace. What grace. Just incredible. And then we have verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is actually my last main point, though I will warn you, there was a few other little points after this. <laughs> this is a really important truth here, I believe. That it's why why are we saved? What's the purpose of our salvation? Now, what I'm about to share may not <coughs> may not be news to you. But it may be. It's, it's actually a controversial truth, an unpopular truth in this human-centred, you know, me-first world we live in. And it's a truth that undermines uh, the prosperity gospel, which is not a bad thing. Uh, and it's a truth that if we apply to our lives, I believe it will probably prevent and, and resolve nearly all conflict, criticism, negativity and strife in our lives and in the church. Do you want to know what it is? Thank you. Two of you do. <laughs> it's not about you. And it's not about me. This act of grace that we're unpacking this morning, this story that uh, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, can testify to, that we're dead enemies of God, that God chooses to reach into our lives and resurrect our spirits and raise us up to a position seating next to his eternally glorified son. Our salvation is not about us at all. It's not for our benefit, our comfort, our glory, though those things occur as part of it, but it, it's not why God does it. It's to display God's glory in great big neon lights for all eternity. That's what we've just read in verse 7. And in this passage and throughout scripture, it's all about Jesus. <coughs> our story, our salvation story, is all about Jesus. Our resurrected lives are all about Jesus. And our aim should be to put Jesus in the limelight of our lives. Our conduct, our words, our thoughts should shine a spotlight on Jesus because at the end of the day, it's all about him and it's not about me and it's not about you. And so verse 7 just declares that this salvation story we have that, um, we've, we, that some, we've experienced is actually there to give God glory, 
now and into all eternity. It's about him. It's his story. And if we could just keep that front and centre in our lives, that it's all about him, it would deal with a huge amount of problems. And then we have verse 8, which kind of hammers home, Paul hammers home this point that it's all about him. Uh, Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. This, This truth here is probably one of the most distinguishable doctrines of all other religions in the world. That it's the one that sets Christianity apart, that we do nothing in any way to contribute to our salvation. That's what the word, when, when, the, when the Bible writes this, that's what it's pointing to. It's not pointing to grace and faith on their own. It's pointing to this whole salvation story. This is a gift from God. It's, it has to be, this, this amazing story has to be received and it has to be opened. That's the only part we play, which doesn't really contribute to the salvation at all. And this, this amazing picture of God reaching into the lives of his enemy and resurrecting, it's all by the work of Jesus on the cross. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took God's wrath and judgment that was due me and due you. And this amazing experience that we've reading about this morning is yours, if you want it, just by putting your faith in God making him your saviour and following him. And it's well worth it. It is a gift. And the thing I love about this that Paul writes is that, is that we don't do anything to contribute to it. It puts all the emphasis on God. There's nothing that we do to contribute to our salvation. And that's a comfort. That's a comfort that we don't do anything to contribute to our salvation. Now, why is it a comfort? You might ask. You might not. But I'm going to answer that. Put your hand up this morning if you uh, have, or you think you have sinned, either consciously or unconsciously, in the last week. Okay, I think that's pretty much everyone in the room. And that's why it's a comfort, because if our salvation is reliant upon us in any way, then everyone that just put their hand up may well have lost their salvation in the last week. That's why it's a comfort, that, that being saved by God is all of God's work, and it's all by him. It's not by me at all, not by you. Thank God. (laughs) So as Paul writes, not only is the purpose of salvation his story, uh, it's all about God. It's all done by him anyway. I can't take any credit of it, not even a bit, and it's all about Jesus. So just to sum up, we're, we're dead. Spiritually speaking, before God intervenes, we are spiritually dead. In fact, we are God's enemies because of sin, that we all were born with and act out. But God, remember those hope-filled words this week, but God chooses to reach into the lives of those, <coughs> of those that follow Jesus and re- re- resurrect our spirits and seats us in close relationship with God for all eternity. What grace. And this is all about him. His grace, mercy and love. Our salvation will tell a story about him across all eternity to come. It's not about us. And our response is to spend our lives doing whatever God would have us do for his glory. And that's actually where this passage ends in verse 10. That we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand. And that was just something, just to finish off, that comforted me. The opportunities that we're all going to get this week and going forward to display God's glory were prepared beforehand. Everything you walk into, God's been there already. He's put you in that position there in who you are. You're his workmanship. He knows you inside out. He's put you in the right place at the right time, no matter how uncomfortable you feel to do his work. That's our, our response. That's where I'm going to leave it this morning. What an amazing story of grace what an amazing picture of God and our responses to worship and glorify him and my 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 invitation really is that if you know him already then let's just dwell on these truths because just for me when I was preparing this talk it just made me go God you are amazing (laughs) and just just fueled my worship and if you don't know him this morning then this morning is a brilliant opportunity to just say God I can see that you died 
for the sins of the world. You died for my sins. And I, I have an opportunity this morning to invite you to be my saviour and to follow you and to enjoy this amazing transformed experience of new life in Christ, spiritually alive for the first time ever. And I can tell you now from personal experience, it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. Let's, let's just pray for a minute and then Sarah and a band, I think, are coming up. Okay. Father God, we give you the glory, the praise, the thanks that you are the author of salvation. That it was because you chose to resurrect us that we know you. God, we give you praise and thanks for our salvation story. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that this is an invitation to every single person here and we will meet throughout our lives. And our response is just to be in awe and worship of you <coughs> and to do the good works that you have prepared beforehand for us to do. Lord, I want to pray this week that we would go deeper in you, in our experiences of you. And I pray, Lord, that we would seize every opportunity that you have already lined up for us to share this incredible story of love and grace that you reach out to every single person that we're going to come across with. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.